What do Ban Ki-moon, the African Union, EU, and of all things, IKEA, have in common? If you guessed the Western Sahara, I'd, well, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. But that's exactly the issue they all found themselves mixed up in, when the now former UN Secretary General visited a number of refugee camps for displaced people in a remote part of Algeria. This greatly upset Morocco, which accused the UN of dropping its neutrality and was pretty much ditto for Sweden a year earlier when its parliament undertook a controversial vote resulting in Rabat's decision to block expansion of everyone's favorite furniture store in 2015. So what exactly is the issue here? That kind of depends on who you ask, but generally speaking, it boils down to a territorial dispute between Morocco and a largely unrecognized country, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. For more episodes like this, be sure to subscribe down below, click the bell for all notifications, and yeah, that's, that's it. Roughly the size of Colorado, Western Sahara is located in the Western Sahara. More specifically, it borders Morocco proper to the north, a tiny bit of Algeria in the northeast, and Mauritania circles the rest. It's one of the most sparsely populated territories in the world, with under 600,000 people in total, the vast majority of which, about 40%, live in the city of Layoun, or hug the Atlantic coast with its relatively untouched fisheries. And the interior pretty much is all uninhabited desert. But it's here we find the roughly 20 to 25% of Western Sahara, controlled by the Palisario Front, the so-called liberated territories. The rest is under Moroccan control. So to understand exactly how we got here, let's take a tiny step back, just a few hundred years, give or take. Morocco claims a long-standing historic link to the Western Sahara, and there is some truth to this. As far back as the Almoravids, a Berber Arab confederation in the 11th century whose rule extended as far north as Iberia, Al-Andalus in Arabic, the rulers of what is today Morocco held considerable influence over the now disputed region. This continued under the later Almohad Caliphate and Maranid Sultanate, although the degree of overt control declined and it was likely more economic and cultural in nature. The most concrete link to Western Sahara, however, is that of the Alawite dynasty, still in power today, which directly and indirectly came to control a considerable portion of Northwest Africa, including parts of Western Sahara. Slowly but surely though, Morocco lost these territories to encroaching colonial powers, namely France and Spain. Now, that being said, they didn't exactly go quietly. Mohammed Mustafa Mal Ayin, the Kayad of Tindouf, now part of Algeria, and Samra in Western Sahara, proclaimed a jihad against foreign colonizers in 1904. Things get a little bit complicated here since Al Ayin, from present-day Mauritania, was appointed by the Sultan of Morocco, but operated without any direct Moroccan control, leading a small, militant organization, the Gudfia, in an anti-colonial revolt that extended far beyond the North African Kingdom's borders. They achieved some success, creating a coalition force among the region's many desperate tribes, and in 1905 even assassinated the French colonial leader of Mauritania who was then preparing for a march on the emirate of Adrar. But when the Sultan of Morocco bowed to foreign pressure and granted substantial concessions to colonial powers, Alain decided to help the Sultan's brother overthrow him in a coup. You'd think everything would be good now, but no. The new Sultan proved just as weak, perhaps even more so, and so Alain extended his jihad to overthrowing the guy he just got placed on the throne. He ultimately wasn't able to pull off this hat trick, and was defeated by French forces in 1910, dying a few months later. Morocco was then forced to recognize a dual Franco-Spanish protectorate over its vastly diminished territory. While all this had been going on, Spain had steadily increased its presence on the African mainland, south of the Canary Islands. Even though the Emir of Adrar had no actual claim to the territory here, Madrid still got him to sign off on a treaty ceding the lands to what later became known as Spanish Sahara. Now this is where things get a bit tricky again, because while Mauritania had no actual claim per se here, neither did Morocco. It all pretty much came down to just historic and cultural ties. And it was this ambiguity that led both countries to claim Western Sahara as their own in the mid 20th century. Before that, France and Spain, they, uh, they had to go. The tide of North African revolt washes over Morocco as rebelling Arabs for a time overrun the city of Casablanca, shortly after the arrival of the new French resident general. 
In an orgy of destruction, whole sections of the city are set ablaze, completely overwhelming the efforts of firefighters whose only resort is the ancient bucket brigade. In three days of almost uncontrolled rioting, scores of vehicles are put to the torch, some with the occupants in them. Shops which had been kept closed by protesting Arab nationalists are burned and looted. As the long smoldering discontent with French rule flares, little escapes the aroused rebels. Eighty persons die as rebellious Arabs attack Arabs loyal to the French, who declare martial law and rush in troops from France and other colonies to quell the uprising. Hundreds are rounded up, and prisoner compounds are filled to overflowing as France fights for North African survival. The first half of that problem wasn't so bad, with Morocco regaining its independence in 1956, shortly followed by Mauritania in 1960. Spain, however, under Francisco Franco, dug in. Newly independent Morocco wasn't having any of it, though. Mohammed V openly expressed an interest in regaining territories then still under Spanish control and encouraged others in achieving that goal. This included a loose band of Moroccan insurgents and Sahrawi rebels known as the Moroccan Army of Liberation. Riding the wave of decolonization then sweeping across Africa, the Moroccan Army of Liberation laid siege to the small enclave of Ifni in 1957, while a simultaneous offensive aimed to support an uprising in Spanish Sahara. In what is sometimes called the Forgotten War, a joint Franco-Spanish force ultimately proved victorious. Madrid, nevertheless, decided to return the disputed colonial possession of Cape Juby to Morocco, and later would do the same with Ifni in 1969. While the short-lived war led to a united Morocco proper, it also stoked ambitions for restoring a greater pre-colonial Morocco which logically would include the remaining European outpost of Spanish Sahara. There was just one small problem. The war had also begun to stoke the ambitions of the Sahrawi people for their own self-determination. After the Ifni War, it was the Sahrawi who arguably felt most of its consequences. In the Spanish crackdown that followed, many were forced to abandon their nomadic lifestyle. Still others were deported or conscripted into the colonial army. Madrid would in no uncertain terms allow a repeat of the previous uprising. The increasingly oppressive nature of colonial rule in Spanish Sahara gave rise to a growing sense of nationalism and solidarity among the Sahrawi. This culminated in the so-called liberation movement of the 1960s and 1970s, or Harakat Tahrir, which sought a peaceful end to Spanish rule. However, when thousands gathered in the Zemla district of Layoun for a demonstration, Spanish authorities tried arresting the group's leader, Mohamed Basiri. A riot soon broke out with security forces clashing with protesters. Basiri, detained by the Spanish, was likely tortured and then simply disappeared while in custody. In all likelihood, he was executed and buried in an undisclosed location among the many sand dunes that surround the city. This event became known as the Zemla Intifada, or Zemla Uprising, and it changed how Sahrawi nationalists would act going forward. It was the beginning of armed struggle. And in 1971, a group of university students in Morocco organized what became known as the Embryonic Movement for the Liberation of Saguia al Hamra and Rio de Oro. The group soon rebranded, however, under a new, shorter name in 1973, the Polisario Front. Targeting isolated posts manned by colonial soldiers, the Polisario gathered a cache of weapons, experience, and new recruits from deserters, eventually controlling large swaths of the remote countryside. Partially because of this growing insurgency and international pressure from the UN to decolonize, Spanish rule quickly began to unravel and Madrid looked for an exit strategy. It decided to hold a referendum in 1975 on whether the territory would become an independent country or be integrated with one of the neighboring countries, Morocco or Mauritania. Morocco requested the referendum be postponed, calling for a hearing from the International Court of Justice on its claim of sovereignty over the territory. The UN agreed and sent a visiting mission that found an overwhelming consensus among the Sahrawi people for independence. A day after this, the ICJ published its opinion about Western Sahara, saying that both Morocco and Mauritania had historic ties to the territory, but nothing that would imply legal sovereignty. So what happened next? Well, just days afterwards, some 350,000 Moroccan citizens, along with 25,000 soldiers, crossed the border into Western Sahara. 
Known as the Green March, this move was designed to put additional pressure on Spain to transfer sovereignty. But while Spanish forces offered no resistance to the advancing Moroccans, the Polisario did, essentially kicking off what became the 16-year-long Western Saharan War. Then Francisco Franco died, and Spain decided enough was enough. It wanted out. Talks were held with Morocco and Mauritania, resulting in the Madrid Accords, in which Spain would hand administrative control of the northern two-thirds of Western Sahara to Morocco, while Mauritania controlled the southern third. Importantly, the accord was to be temporary, and was not a transfer of sovereignty. This did little to assuage the Polisario, who argued the accord was not in standing with the ICJ's advisatory opinion on self-determination for the Sahrawi people. As Moroccan and Mauritanian troops moved in, they again met with heavy resistance from the Polisario, now backed by Algeria. On February 26, 1976, all Spanish troops withdrew from Western Sahara. The very next day, the Polisario proclaimed the creation of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. Taking the war to Mauritania first, the Polisario attacked iron mines in the country's north. In one such incursion, a number of French technicians were taken captive, prompting Paris to deploy its air force in a broad military operation against the group. French jets bombed Polisario forces, but despite this, the Sahrawi rebels were able to launch an attack on the Mauritanian capital, leading the war-weary nation to seek a ceasefire. In 1979, Mauritania relinquished its claims to Western Sahara, withdrawing its military forces. Morocco in turn quickly moved in, claiming the lands left by Mauritania. Fighting continued, but in 1982, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic was admitted to the Organization of African Unity, the precursor to today's African Union. In protest, Morocco withdrew its membership. After nearly 16 years of conflict that may have left upwards of 20,000 people dead, a UN-monitored ceasefire was signed between the Polisario and Morocco in 1991, which stated that a referendum would take place within six months. It still hasn't occurred, though. Several attempts were made in the 1990s, but there were disagreements over voter eligibility. Things had changed in Western Sahara. Partially because of the war, Sahrawis now only make up roughly 30% of the population. Many had relocated to camps in Algeria and Mauritania, but were they entitled to vote? What about Moroccans who had settled in Western Sahara? Obviously, these aren't easy questions to answer. A different approach was taken in the early 2000s, with Baker Plan and Baker Plan II proposing the creation of an autonomous Sahrawi government under the sovereignty of Morocco with a transitional period of five years leading to a referendum for Western Sahara. While the first version was rejected, the Polisario accepted the latter, which also was unanimously endorsed by the UN Security Council. Morocco, however, rejected the plan, stating they would no longer accept a referendum with independence as an option. Also of note, during the ceasefire, but predating it as well, Morocco built a series of defensive berms, the largest of which is known as the Moroccan Western Saharan Wall and stretches 2,700 kilometers, or about 1,700 miles. Heavily fortified with barbed wire, guard posts, and landmines, these structures essentially led to a stalemate in the war and continue to divide the territory between Moroccan and Polisario-controlled areas today. The future remains uncertain for the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, and sporadic fighting has resumed following the breakdown of a near 30-year peace deal in November 2020. For now, though, the Polisario remains in charge of a government in exile in Algeria. Their breakaway republic is currently recognized by 39 UN member states and South Ossetia, while some 45 other countries have since withdrawn, frozen, or suspended their previous recognition. No country, aside from Morocco itself, has officially recognized Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara. That is, until recently. In late 2020, a number of states recognized Morocco's claim to the Western Sahara, perhaps most notably the United States, which announced it will be opening a consulate in the territory. Others, while not recognizing Moroccan claims per se, continue to operate in the region in some capacity, like the EU, which has multiple fishing agreements with Morocco that include parts of the Western Sahara. Several European states are also involved in the mining of phosphates and offshore exploration of potential oil and natural gas reserves. And, for lack of a better phrase, because of all this, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic in many ways remains a ghost country, despite a fair amount of recognition from fellow African nations and beyond. Hey, thanks everyone for listening to this episode of Ghost Countries. I had a fun time doing research for this one, and, like always, really enjoy highlighting some lesser-known geopolitical issues. So what do you guys think the future holds for the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic? 
Honestly, that question was a lot more nebulous a few months back, but with the recent diplomatic exchange that occurred between the United States and Morocco and a host of other countries, it seems like Moroccan claims of sovereignty over the Western Sahara are becoming increasingly solidified. And despite a resumption of hostilities between the Polisario and Morocco, I really don't see this trend changing dramatically in the near future. Morocco certainly enjoys military advantages that the Polisario, even with foreign backing, could really never compete with. And even though there is support for the Polisario and Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic both on the continent and internationally, I just don't really see this as enough to shift the balance of power in terms of the way that things are trending. But who knows, things can change in unexpected ways and this is very much a fluid situation. Anyway, please feel free to share your opinions down in the comment section below, and if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, and I'll see you again next time. Peace!